uh, you will see why. We're only going to focus on one aspect of this, but I do want us to see this glorious text in its context, and I pray that the Spirit of God will move in our hearts to help us see and understand what our great and God is uh, our great God is teaching us. Let's stand together. Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8 beginning in verse 1. Let us hear the word of God. And it came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. And certain women, which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others, which ministered unto him of their substance. And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit an hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil, and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. And that which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to perfection. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart have heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with patience. No man, when he hath lighted a candle, covereth it with a vessel, or putting it under a bed, but setteth it on a candlestick, that they which enter in may see the light. We will continue through verse 18. For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. Take heed, therefore, how ye hear. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given. And whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken, even that which he seemeth to have. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his good word. Let's unite our hearts in prayer. Father, we thank Thee for mercy drops round us falling, but for showers of blessing we plead. We plead that Thy mighty Spirit would fall upon us. Even this little gathering here tonight, we know, O oh Lord, that Thy eye of love and grace and mercy is fixed upon us as it is all of thy blood-bought sheep across this globe. Thou knowest their place, thou knowest their state, thou knowest their need, and thou dost meet it in Christ. Lord, meet with us. Meet with us. Come by the mighty power of thy Spirit. Come 
with fire from heaven. Fill our hearts with love for thee. Give us ears to hear. And we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. God's word is God's infallible voice to our fallible world. And Christ, who is the light, shined light to sinful human beings by preaching and teaching the Holy Scriptures. As our God-breathed text says of Jesus, He went throughout every city and village preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom. Furthermore, in our text, Jesus exhorted his disciples, and therefore us, to take heed, that is, to consider carefully how they heard the Holy Scriptures. The God-man was not simply speaking of an auditory experience, but of transformation, salvation, and edification. So our message is entitled, Listening to God's Word Carefully. He wanted His disciples to carefully consider what he was saying, and he demands the same of us. So our message is entitled, Listening to God's Word Carefully. And may the God who made us, may God our Father, may the God that speaks to us be pleased to shed the light of his Holy Spirit in our hearts so that we might love and obey the voice of our Savior in this text. First, Jesus Christ preached and taught God's Word to bring light into this world. That's the primary idea here. It is a very rich passage, as uh, almost every uh, gospel text is. But we want to consider what He's getting at, may the Lord help us. Luke makes abundantly clear that the focus of Jesus' ministry was preaching and teaching affirmed by miracles. You know, we want to be clear about this. The miracles, important as they were, were not the spotlight though that's what drew most of the people. And we're probably not surprised by that. The miracles affirmed Christ's word. They affirmed His claims, His teaching, His preaching. He came to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. That is our nature. That is the nature of humankind outside of faith in Christ. Their lives, no matter how spectacular, famous, or insignificant they may appear to the world, whoever they are outside of Christ lives in darkness, spiritual darkness, slaves of sin, of false ideas, of self-deception and self-worship. In the synagogue of Nazareth, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, quoting Isaiah, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. What did he come to do? To preach the word of God. This is what brings light into men's darkness. And we find him preaching and teaching throughout 
Luke's gospel. And in our text, Jesus delivered a most important parable. Verses 4 through 15. But here is one of our Lord's most well-known parables. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all give it a foundational role among the parables they recorded in their Gospels. Yet our purpose this evening is not to give an exposition of this important parable here, but to summarize. Each of the soils represents a group of hearers. Now, this is crucial. Don't let that slip, because this is exactly why he warns his disciples about how they hear. Jesus explained his parable thus, The seed is the word of God. He then explained how each soil responded to the word to the light of the first soil Jesus said the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved Paul will later say if our gospel be hid it is hid from them that are lost in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not that the light of Jesus Christ the Son of God should shine into them. That is, he, we have an enemy that blinds our hearts from the light, the Word of God. <clears throat> of the second soil, Jesus said, they received the Word with joy. They received the Word with joy. And these have no firm root. They believe for a while and in time of temptation fall away. Of the third soil, he said, these are the ones who have heard. And as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life. And bring no fruit. To maturity. All of these are interacting with the Word of God. They are people in darkness, and each of them responds differently to the light of God's Word, but not one of them produces heavenly fruit. Jesus then concluded there is but one good soil, and that is the fourth. They which, in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with patience. Now, we may see three vital elements here in the fourth soil. One, these hearers possess an honest and good heart. The prophet Jeremiah says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Is there contradiction here? No. This is man's natural, sinful condition. A wicked heart is the heart of a lost person. But the prophet Ezekiel declares God's wonderful grace. A new heart also will I give you, says the living God. Notice, he doesn't patch up an evil heart. He doesn't fix a heart that's gone out. He gives a new one. There are no spiritual stents. There's no unclogging of this heart. There's no fiddling with the ventricles or any of the, the, the various aspects of the heart. It's open heart surgery and a complete replacement 
of the heart. In other words, this is what being born of God, being born from above, being born again means. A new heart will I give you, a new spirit will I put within you, and what follows this act of God's grace. He says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. In other words, you'll hear my word and you'll obey me. You will hear my word and you will obey me. And it's not because you're great people. It's not because you're wonderful. It's not because you've figured it out and now you know the magic key. It's not the 12 steps to holiness. It's the fact that God does an operation that transforms a human being called the new birth. And their control central, their human headquarters of personhood, their heart is transformed by God's amazing love, by God's amazing grace. The great physician does the most astonishing heart surgery imaginable. He gives us a new heart. A new heart that loves His Word. A new heart that loves Him. A new heart with new desires, new tastes. So, those words that Christ here uses, honest and good hearts, doesn't mean nice people. It doesn't mean, well, folks are a little nicer than some of the others in your neighborhood. It's not those people that just seem to kind of come into the world with sunshine on their face. Now, they can be extremely wicked. It's people that have been given new hearts. That is why Christ can say they have an honest and good heart. Because He gave it. While it is true, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked outside of Christ. Dear child of God, if you are born from above, you are not governed by a wicked heart that is desperately sick anymore. You are governed by a new heart. Well, why do I have these struggles? Because of your flesh. Read Paul. Something has been changed and changed forever. Hence, Christ is talking about the good soil as those who have been given new hearts. They're honest hearts. They're good hearts because having been given by God, they want what is good. And that is what sets up the struggle in their lives. The spirit within them, which has renewed their heart, struggles over and daily, over again and daily, with the flesh. That is exactly what Paul writes to us in Galatians chapter 5. Secondly, they keep the word. Because they have honest and good hearts, they keep the word. In Greek, the word keep means to adhere firmly to beliefs. To adhere firmly to beliefs. To hold fast. All of this springs from the heart. And thirdly, they bring forth fruit with patience. The Lord is giving us very simple imagery, but profound truth. When someone is born of God's Spirit, they have a hunger for 
God's Word. And they indeed walk in it. Okay, disclaimer time. Of course, no one does this perfectly. Everybody wants you to run to that part as quickly as possible. But I would focus you on this. Yes, the Lord's people fail. Yes, the, the Lord's people still have that flesh that fights them day in and day out as that honest and good heart wants to do what God wants them to do. They find themselves miserable and sometimes powerless, seemingly, in the presence of sin. Now, that's partially because they're still ignorant of who they are in Christ. Half of the battle is understanding what your enemy really is, and who you really are in Christ. God's people need to understand that He has worked a miracle beyond anything that we can truly grasp apart from His Word and the illumination of the Spirit. He transforms people so that they desire to and actually can walk according to the light of the word. No one does it perfectly. Okay, feel better? All right, but now that doesn't matter as long as you understand what I'm saying, what Christ is saying. Out of an honest and good heart, they keep the word, they bear fruit with patience. They work day in and day out and they struggle and they fail and they get up and they go again because there's something different. There is something transformed. There is something powerful that even when they seem to be flickering and about to go out, the Lord doesn't let them go. It is because of who you are in Christ Jesus. It always goes back to Christ. But we have often taught grace in such a way is that the Lord's people immediately take the view of put it in the cruise control and just kind of head on toward heaven and you know we're just miserable sinners begging bread no we're more than that we are more than that we are children of God children purchased given life made alive raised from the dead God's adopted children. Now, I, I understand we're, you know, we come to the Lord as, you know, those poverty-stricken beggars, of course. But you don't stop there. You are born of the Spirit, and then you're children of God, and then you're being matured by the teaching of the Word, Ephesians chapter 4, to become the measure of Christ, full men, grown men, mature men, in Christ. This is why this fourth soil is so important. They hear the word differently than the other three soils. And therefore their response to the word is different than the other three soils. They bear fruit with patience. Now, the idea of he, here of patience actually means the capacity to hold out. The idea is really perseverance. Bearing up in the face of difficulty because of one, who Christ is, and number two, who you are in Christ. This is important. And it's encouraging for the Christian walk. Christ the sower and his faithful ministers down through the ages all know the reality of this parable. Jesus and his word bring the light of life. Life. And the more you grow in Christ, the more you see how rank and filthy your flesh is. But it's at that very point that we must believe the word. As I said this morning in staff prayer, we must believe what God has done in us. I will give you a new heart. As much as we believe what he's done for us. And it's that, it's that 
who we are and what he's done in us that we often miss altogether. It's just as though our salvation is only the declaration of being righteous. It's only the legal act of justification. And that is not true. Yes, justification, glorious, pure, holy, thrilling as it is. Justification by faith alone in Christ alone. But we're sanctified. He's not only declared us righteous, but he's making us righteous. Having given us a new heart, having given us a new spirit, and causing us out of love to respond to his word. This parable is about Hearing the word, responding to its light. And we must all examine our own hearts according to the soils that he sets before us. That's the idea. How do you hear the word of God? How do you hear the word of God? I repeat, how, how do you hear? The word of God. Jesus says, well, there's at least four ways. Only one of them's good. <clears throat> so. Many hear the word, but only the good soil bears fruit. And that brings us then to this. Jesus then taught what God's truth accomplishes, verse 16. He explained this in simple terms of light. Verse 16 is a common sense explanation from ordinary life that presents eternal truth. When someone lights a candle, it is for one purpose. To illuminate the darkness. Jesus tells us something that even children understand. We turn on the light so that we can see. Right, children? We don't usually have to walk into a pitch black room not knowing what's in there or thinking that maybe I left something out on the floor that I might trip over. Or maybe someone's in there. I want to turn that light on so we can see. No one lights a candle or a lamp and then puts it under a jar or a bowl. Neither would they put it under the couch or under the bed. We recently had a power outage for several hours and we were uh, moving around the house carefully and cautiously getting to our battery powered light sources. And it would have been a completely ridiculous to turn on the flashlight or the little uh, lantern that we have that runs by batteries and then stick it under the bed or put a, a blanket over it. That would be absurd. And, and that's how simple Christ's lesson is here. <clears throat> we bring forth light to dispel darkness. That is what Je and that is what Jesus came into the world to do. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He is the day spring, uh, the, the, that glorious dawn from, the high, from on high that has visited us. That's how Luke begins. To give light, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. That's you and me and every human being on the planet until that moment that God gives us a new heart. We will be blind unless God gives us eyes to see. We will be deaf unless he gives us ears to hear. We will be dead unless he raises us from the dead by that miracle of resurrection called being born again. What does truth accomplish? Well, this idea of light tells us it dispels darkness for those who hear. 
for those who hear. Gospel light dispels the darkness of sin, the flesh, and the devil. Jesus said that he brings forth light so that they which enter in may see the light. Not everybody enters into the kingdom. Only those who repent and believe will enter to see the light. And they can see more and more light. Jesus finally turned his attention to the day of judgment. Verse 17, he said, For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. Light illuminates. Light exposes. That's a very simple but a very crucial point. Paul would later write, All things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. In other words, do you want to know if something is right or wrong? Turn on the light. Go to God's book and get light on the subject. This becomes your spotlight. This becomes your high-powered flashlight. I mean, you, you can walk into rooms sometimes uh, in old houses and turn on the light and, and critters of every sort, roaches and, and rats run in every direction. That light exposes them. They go about doing what they're doing in the dark without any problem until someone brings the light to the situation. That's the problem with secret sin, by the way. People under self-delusion, demonic stupidity hide things thinking they're getting away with it when it's all always under God's light Paul's word reprove here all things that that are reproved are made manifest by light whatsoever doth make manifest is light. You cannot see the shapes of things. You cannot see the height, the depth, the width of things without light. You can't see the color without light. You can't tell if someone's tall or short or round or angular or thin or not without light. And Jesus says, everything's going to come under the light. There aren't going to be any secrets. Children very often think that they're going to be keeping secrets with their friends. And sometimes they're brokenhearted later on when they find out that their friend went and blabbed. Problem is, that happens to adults too. And sometimes when that exposure goes on, it breaks your heart. Let me tell you what, this is nothing compared to the day of judgment. In the day of judgment, everything that people tried to hide is going to be just like that light in the dark house. And every shape and every cockroach and every wicked creature of the night will be exposed Every thought, every word, every deed. It's one of the interesting things about history. Very often things go on in our lives that we, we know nothing about. I was studying some matters, of, not studying because I was on vacation. I was reading and watching some things about the 60s, uh, my generation. And it is astonishing things that are coming out right now. And when you understand those things... You look at this world and you go, oh, that's how that happened. That's where that came from. Oh, that's what this is rooted in. Rather than the day of judgment is going to be astonishing, mind-blowing 
beyond anything that any of us have ever imagined. We will discover things, we will hear things, and there will be people ashamed beyond belief because their, their closely held secret will be secret no more. No secrets, children, no secrets will ever be forgotten by God. And that day is coming and we will stand in the presence of him that John says in his epistle, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. It's not talking about necessarily scientific biological light. It's talking about his unspeakable holiness. A holiness so grand, so majestic, so pure. We will be shocked to be in that light. Just to be in it will leave us stupefied. Every one of God's children throughout the Bible that is exposed to even just the visions of God fall on their faces dead. The day of judgment is going to be the event of events in the program of God. Because then all that God has done to save his people from their sins and all the things that people have done rejecting Christ and his light will all be made manifest. And his people will be praising him and magnifying him and thrilled with him and overwhelmed that they even have a corner in heaven. And those who stand before him without Christ will be gripped with an unchanging Fear that will be theirs for the rest of eternity. Jesus said, you need to listen carefully when I'm speaking. You need to hear the word of God carefully. Because it's the only entrance to the kingdom. Jesus' gospel light, empowered by the Holy Spirit, shines in the sinner's darkness to expose his sins and bring him to repentance and faith. Gospel light shines into the deepest crevices of our hearts and dispels darkness. Oh, we can see some ugly things in there. Pride. Envy, lust, hate, anger, grudge. It's one of the best things in the world when the Lord shames you. There's a lot of talk about body shaming today and fat shaming and all that kind of stuff. Tell you what, the Spirit of God does sin shaming. He does. He exposes us and we see it and we cry out for redemption. We cry out to be cleansed. We cry out to be righteous and God hears. He hears. So, those who die in their sins have lived in darkness And shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So in our text, Jesus' words here make clear that the day of judgment is coming when he will judge all men and will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And that brings us to our second main head. Jesus then warned his disciples to hear God's word carefully. That's what this builds up to. Even when 
a parable is repeated in the various Gospels. Each author brings out different aspects of that parable. And Luke makes that obvious here. Jesus concluded this sobering exhortation this way. Take heed, therefore, how you hear. Now, children, I imagine that all of you here have heard your parents say, Are you listening to me? Anybody heard that before? Are you listening? Micah, are you listening? Hannah, are you listening? Abigail, are you listening? Now, when your parents are saying that, I imagine most of you here, if I know your parents well, if they're saying that, you want to make sure that your response is not, huh? You don't want to do that. You want, you want your memory banks to be working as hard as possible at that moment. Because they have detected that while they're talking to you and instructing you about something that they believe to be important, somehow they're not seeing a reciprocal response. They're not seeing that you're taking it as something important. How much more when God speaks? How much more? We're thinking, well, you know, uh, what's going on in my, my life? What's going on in my week? What's happened in my day? What am I going to do about the children? What am I going to do about the paycheck? What am I going to do about, oh, well, oh, let's see, God speaking. Uh, well, yeah, I read my Bible, uh, I think, one day last week. God speaking every day. Light is shining into darkness. And what Jesus is telling us is that we want to be very careful about how we hear him. Not just that we hear him, but how. In his parable, all four soils, meaning four kinds of people, heard the word. They all heard it. But three of them didn't hear it. Three of them did not bring forth fruit. Again, children, let me use you as an example. Sometimes mom and dad uh, tell you to do something. <laughs> Husbands, sometimes your wife asks you to do something. And you say, sure. And you go about doing it. And you didn't do it right. You didn't get what they were saying to you. Now, sometimes it's because... We're not listening. We're not paying attention. Or we think we have it when indeed we haven't listened well. I personally hate to fail on that one. And, and I do. I want to hear it. I want to get it. I want to do it just like it's been requested. But I can miss it. And it's very painful for me to be reminded that I must not have been paying attention. How much more with God? He's speaking. Do we know how to live? Do we know how to do what he's telling us to do? And are we doing it right? There's a day of judgment coming. Jesus is saying, are you listening? The day of judgment's coming. Everything's going to be exposed. How are you listening? How are you hearing? Faith. 
three of these, as I just said, do not bring forth fruit. The word stolen by the devil, the word unavailing for apostates, and the word choked out by cares and riches and pleasures of the world. Listen, don't think this is somebody else. This is all of us. Take care how you hear. Be careful how you listen. The central word is obvious, is it not? How. Not that. How. You can hear the word of God without hearing fruitfully. You can hear the best sermons Ever and bear no fruit. This is what Jesus is connecting. This is what's happened in each one of the soils. They heard it, and sometimes they even heard it with joy. Oh, that's what a great sermon! But they didn't live it on Monday, or maybe even Sunday afternoon. And preachers can even preach it and act at the end of the day like they didn't preach it. How are you hearing? Are you listening? How are you hearing Jesus? He so loves his people. He loved them before the foundation of the world. He loved them with a love so great, so high, so immense, so free that he said, I will be their prophet and tell them the way of salvation. I will be their priest. I will offer up the, sal- the sacrifice that my father will receive. The only one he will receive, I will offer it up. It will be my body. It will be my blood. I will rise again and I will enter into glory and I will intercede for them. I love them so that I will be their king. They don't know how to govern themselves, but I will give them a new heart. I will give them the Holy Spirit. I will give them my inspired, infallible, and preserved word. And I will give them my people to make them more and more like me. Are we listening? Are we listening? How are we listening? How and what are we hearing? Oh, what love, what grace, what mercy our God shows us. Shouldn't that draw our ears? I mean, stop and think. There are times when you've said, well, my wife was talking about me this way and she was up in my face about this and and I would have responded in a more Christ-like way if she hadn't been griping at me or vice versa. It could be the, the, uh, the, the wife saying, well, if he was just doing what he was supposed to do, if he was supposed to, uh, hey, love me like Christ loves the church, haven't seen much of that lately. If he just loved me a little better, I'd act a little more like a Christian. I would say, you're not hearing the word. You're not hearing what this word says. How are you hearing? Oh, we, brethren, there's so many ways that we can have an auditory experience without it being fruitful. To those who listen with a new heart, that hold fast the word and persevere, there's good news. For whosoever hath to him shall be given. Now that's one of those sayings that sounds a little mysterious at first. But it just means this. Do you love the word? You'll understand it better. Do you love Jesus Christ? You'll get to know him more. Do you search for him in the scriptures? He'll reveal himself. Do you listen to his voice in the scriptures? He'll help you grasp it. 
Do you commune with him in the scriptures? He will not ignore you. He'll give you more. Do you walk with him in the scriptures? He'll give you more strength, more grace. Take heart. Christ loves his people. So listen. Listen carefully. <clears throat> well, the gracious God, listen, listen, the gracious God will give you more and more. And more. This is what he's saying. If you have a new heart that loves the word, and you say, Lord, I'm not getting enough of you. I want to know you better. I want to understand this book better. Do you think he would give his life for you and ignore that prayer? Of course not. Now, I'm not saying that within a week, you'll understand the book of Revelation. But if you're crying out to him day by day, you will be amazed at how he meets with you. Especially if you're praying throughout the week for the Lord's Day, you'll be amazed at how he begins to work in the congregation. How are you hearing? How? How? Are you? Are you listening? Because he loves to pour out his treasures upon those who want them. He's not stingy. He wants you to know him and walk with him. This is life eternal, Christ prayed before his crucifixion, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Now, this does not mean, are you listening? This does not mean delight in God, and he will lavish material wealth upon you as some erroneously teach and believe. Not what he's talking about. It means if you delight in God and you want more of him, you will have it. If you're delighted in the Lord and you want him, you will have it. Yet Christ warns, whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken even that which he seemeth to have. It's one thing to talk Christianity and another thing to be listening and walking with the Lord. Hungry for him. Many professors seem to have light. They seem to have life. They seem to have Christ. Nevertheless, unless they have a new heart, unless they hold fast to gospel truth, unless they bear fruit with perseverance, they will lose everything in the end. Eternal gain or loss rests on Christ's exhortation. Take heed how you hear. Well, I'm going to stop for this evening. Keep your outline. And I will... 
conclude this next week. And we will look at at least seven applications of this command. Let's conclude by considering what we've covered. Jesus came into this world to be the light. He said, I am the light of the world. Well, isn't that a nice religious image? Well, what in the world does it mean? It means he's the truth in a world of lies. He has come into this world reflecting the glory and the truth of Almighty God. And we can fellowship with Him. Is that not amazing? But part of that fellowship is built on how we hear Him. None of us hears perfectly. We just don't. But brethren, we can learn to hear better. And that's what we will be talking about next week. What's the practical application? How do we face this daily? How do we hear better? That's what we want to look at with these applications. So you can look at them throughout the week. And then we will come and expand them next week, God willing. But brethren... I say to you with all my heart, God's people often prove to be no better at listening to their heavenly father than earthly children are sometimes in this world. We think we've got it and we run off half cocked when we don't have it. And then we taste bitter fruit and wonder, where's God? Well, he spoke. It was plain. It was clear, but we didn't get it. We didn't say, I want to make sure I've got what the Lord's saying here. Brethren, it's easier sometimes to read nice devotional books than the scriptures. It's easier. Listen up, young men. It's easier to read theology and get a head full of theology and be able to out-argue everybody in the room and be empty spiritually because we're not listening to the Word. We, we have come to the Word and we've now got our system, but we don't really know how to love or to walk with the one upon whom the system is allegedly built. So, because Christ loves us so, let us get better at being listeners. Let's be sure we're hearing him. I can tell you that one of the most important things I tell couples that are in trouble usually begins with me saying to the husband, become the best listener you can be. And you'll be astonished at how some things begin to change in your marriage. And I will say to each one of us, we need to learn to be the best listeners to God's word that we can be. And we'll be amazed at how some things really begin to change. Christ has encouraged us to listen to God's word carefully. May he grant us the grace to do exactly that. And may it bloom into wonderful fruit to his eternal glory. Amen. Father, we thank thee for thy goodness and grace. Now teach us to be better listeners. Help us to hear thee and teach us how to hear thee. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. 
and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Let's go in the name of the Lord Jesus.